Good evening. Um, I'm Carol Mickett, and this is Our Town. And this happens to be the final Our Town for this year, since um, Our Town's always the last Thursday of every month. And in November, we have Thanksgiving, and in December, we have Christmas holidays. So um, this is it for the year, um, which is sad, because I have to wait two more months to um, have another wonderful guest. Um, the thing about our town, in January, my guest was our mayor, who's standing in the back of the room. Um, so welcome, Mr. Mayor, um, to our town. And, and I wanted to bookend it with our deputy mayor, Kanika Tomalin. Um, and in between, I looked at other people. I looked at people who were philanthropists. I looked at Jeff Danner, who used to be on city council and is now spearheading the whole green light campaign, who is actively doing what people do when they leave an elected office. They become super strong participants in a city, and in this way in the county. Um, and I had David Warner, Warren, who's um, um, the editor of Creative Loafing, so a journalist. And I had Sophia Wisneska, who is right here, the chancellor of USFSP, so all about education. All of these things make up, I'm tied, <laughs> excuse me. Um, all of these things make up a great city. But one of the things that's really interesting to me, and this came out when I was speaking to our deputy mayor, is that we make presuppositions about people and who they are. And um, I made some presuppositions about Kanika that weren't true. Um, and I'm sure that many of you in the audience have made presuppositions about me and things about who I am and what I do. And I bet a lot of people in this audience don't know much about who I really, what I do in a big scope of things. So this is what's interesting and important about our town is it's about finding out who are these people that really make up our city. And um, we find out things about these people that are pretty shocking. I remember when Jeff Klinkenberg was our guest, his wife said, you told me things, found out things even I didn't know. <laughs> Which could be shocking. Um, so um, I'm just delighted since this is the last one of the year, I mean, I'm delighted to be able to get to know people. And one of the things that's also interesting is that one of my former guests was your husband, Terry Tomlin. So, and um, when we changed the slide, which, can we change the slide? Aha. <laughs> this is the slide of Pinellas County that came from Terry's um, PowerPoint that I used. So I thought it was appropriate that um, we, we have that up here so we can talk about Pinellas um, and be able to see it. So we have the opportunity tonight to find out about um, this incredible woman who's sitting next to me who has a huge role in our city. She's our deputy mayor. And I think we all want to know, who is she? So um, I'm Terry Tomlin's wife. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, so, so let's find out who this Dr. Kanika Tomlin is. So let's welcome her. And um, I welcome all of you to our town. Thank you. So um, the first question, as everybody knows, I ask is, um, how did you get to St. Pete? 
It's a long time in the making. <laughs> I'm the fifth generation of my family to call St. Petersburg home. So there wasn't a whole lot of choice in the matter. <laughs> But, uh, you know, there's, there's no better place, and so I consider myself super fortunate. But my grandfather's grandmother lived in St. Petersburg. Hmm. Yeah. And is that a maternal side or the paternal? That's on my maternal side, but my paternal side goes way back, too. My father's from Clearwater, but his, father, um, his father's mother lived in St. Petersburg, and, and his grandfather, uh, Luther Jelkson, built most, uh, much of South St. Petersburg. He was... Uh, a contractor in Mason. And what was his name? Luther Jelks. Huh. And these are your parents right here? Yes. It's and Yvonne could and you David stand Jelks. up so that everyone can acknowledge you? <laughs> and will you, will you say their name? My mom is Yvonne Jelks and my father is David Jelks. Well, welcome and thank you for um, having a wonderful daughter. <laughs> So when you were born, where were you born? I was born at St. Anthony's Hospital, and um, I uh, lived a, a couple places as a, as a child. Okay. When I was a little girl. So we're lived... using this to point them out on the map. Okay. So one of the reasons we have the map so we can... So when I was... The house I remember first was actually my parents owned... Um, some apartments, and we lived in one of them, the biggest one, until my hmm. sister was born. And that was um, 26th Avenue, but where I grew up was in West St. Pete, where Pasadena, Bear Creek, and uh, St. Pete meet, just around the corner from Boca Sega High School, What's right about... Bear Creek? That's, that's a there. neighborhood, right about here, so... Is there a creek there named Bear Creek? Uh, yeah, sh sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Can you but kayak in it? <laughs> I never have, but you know, there's Boca Ciega and there are uh, a couple of uh, graveyards that are kind of the, the landmark. Hmm. And that was West St. Mm -hmm. Pete, that was my neighborhood. Okay, so here you go. Here's one of my presuppositions, right? Kanika grew up on the south side. No, wrong. <laughs> she grew up on the west side of St. Pete. So, this is a lot about assumptions one makes. Well, I also made the assumption that Kanika um, didn't have lots of money growing up. She must have been, you know, from the South Side. The stereotype that, you know, I have, probably it's a white thing, white St. Pete. You know, the South Side has um, not high. Well, you grew up in a middle class family. Mm hmm. Like way more Cosby Hi. than Good Times. Right. <laughs> exactly. And, and there's an uh, assumption that I make, and I'm sure lots of other people make it, because that's what we hear in St. Pete. You know, oh, we you know, have to do better education. We have, and, and it's wrong. Uh, and that, to me, is something that, a story we need. Well, and it's a lot of people's story, but it's not mine, and it's yeah. not that of uh, many people who call our city home. That's right. Mm -hmm. So what was it like growing up on that west side? Oh, I had an idyllic childhood. It was fabulous. Mm -hmm. My mom is one of 15, and uh, so... And everybody had at least two kids. Some people had, I guess my Aunt Beatrice has the most kids. She has nine kids. Ten, Ten kids. So Big I had, family. you know, an automatic play group. Everywhere I went, it was awesome. It was idyllic. Uh, I grew up in a, a beautiful home with a, a great front yard that was kind of the gathering spot. And um, it, was, it was wonderful. I had a wonderful childhood. And where did you go to school? I went to Bay Point Elementary. And where's that? Can you point that on on the map? Sure. Let's see. That's right down here. Okay, but you lived on the west side. And I did. What, did you take a bus there? No, I had an aunt that taught there. Ah. Uh -huh. And so I went to school with her. And what was her name? Benita Is Brittany. Her name? And she was actually my kindergarten teacher. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I went to Bay Point Middle and then Tyrone Middle. And then... Uh, Where's Tyrone Middle? Right over where I grew up. Right across Tyrone, the street I from... Uh, yeah, across the street from the mall. From the mall? From the mall. That was such a... 
so challenge you, to concentrate with that. And mall. you had to go over to the mall all the right time after this. school. <laughs> and I went to the Boca Ciega High School. Go Pirates. <laughs> That's where I went to school. So um, when you grew up, what was the relationship that you had between um, black students and white students? I mean, was that a big issue? Um, how did that work? It really wasn't a big issue. I think that my generation was the first to really experience integration without a lot of presupposition and a lot of uh, just kind of heaviness. I grew up in a very integrated school. Bay Point is fantastic because it really mixes uh, peers from various racial backgrounds. That's still true today. Uh, Pinellas Point, the neighborhood that I live in, mm -hmm. has people from every uh, ethnic background, living as peers. And so I went to school in classrooms where, uh, you know, sat, sat next to all types of people, uh, but we had a common experience. And it was really wonderful. It created a global conscious, consciousness that uh, helped us understand perspective of our place in the world. It was great. There was no, no uh, kind of racial issue at all growing so up. So who were your friends? My friends were everyone. Um, my best friend in elementary school was uh, Alexandra Davis, uh, and she was a Jewish girl. And uh, we had a great time. I was at her house every Friday, or she was at my house. You know, my mom raised, helped raise her, and her mom helped raise me. Her mom was actually an editor uh, for the Times, mm -hmm. and uh, that gave me great exposure. Yeah. So, how do you see your experience in public schools? Mm -hmm. um, compared to the experience that students have now? Do you think it's comparable? Do you think it's better now? You know, I don't know. I think that's um, a bit generalized. I mm -hmm. think that times are different uh, and the need for opportunity has expanded in a significant way. And uh, why is that? I, I just think that the way we learn, the access we have to technology, the rate at which we process things, you know, so different uh, boundaries are erasing in the world. Mm. Um, I know that Pinellas County is working very hard to, to keep up with that and make sure that our students are prepared. Mm -hmm. But I feel that I got an education that absolutely prepared me for my brightest future. And I hope that that's what our children are experiencing today. That's what we work hard every day in partnership with the school board to try to ensure. Now you have children. I do have children. I have fantastic children. And, and um, would they stand up? This is Kai. And this is Nia. And who's this? Who's the other? One? And this is I have many children. Okay, you want to stand up? Too? I birthed two, but this is Mackenzie. She is also a child of mine. She's one of my dearest friend's children. Hmm. Her mother is there. So, I have great kids. We're excited today because Kai is a runner. Uh, you can write his name down because he's going to go to the Olympics one day. <laughs> and uh, he had a great race today. Kai, I'm so proud of you. He broke his personal record. Mm -hmm. uh, he's in eighth grade, but he runs varsity cross country, so he's running against high schoolers, uh, you know, throughout mm -hmm. our county. And he came in 12th. And uh, beat well his done. personal record by 32 seconds. <laughs> awesome. So one of the things that um, was you experienced and I'm sure was incredibly beneficial was that when you were growing up, you, and in high school I think it started, you became part of the Ebony Scholar Program. Mm -hmm. So could you discuss that, say what that is and how it started and sure. what it did? So Ebony Scholars is the vision of Verl Davis, who was a longtime educator in Pinellas County, he worked as a principal at St. Petersburg High School, and also worked as an area superintendent. And he was the first black principal in Florida. That's, I didn't know that. Yeah. But and the, I can and certainly the, believe it. Yeah. And, and all these, Charlie Crist was his student, and... Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so huh? he was a pretty transformational guy. He was a transformational and, guy. And um, he understood that African American students needed to have some uh, specialized mentoring to ensure they fulfill their potential. And why was that? Or is that? I think it is that. Uh, because at that time, you know, so this is before 
uh, classroom size amendments or anything that is so regulated. Um, mm -hmm. This was a time of busing where kids often went to school far away mm -hmm. from their homes. And um, there, it was just a generalized learning style that didn't resonate with every student. You know, the difference isn't specific to African American students, but mm -hmm. certainly something that's experienced. Mm -hmm. But he thought that there was space to create uh, a mentoring circle of reinforcement for high achieving African American students to make sure that they not only fulfill their potential while in Pinellas County schools, but go on to college, pursue their dreams, and understand that there are no boundaries. So I created this group called Ebony Scholars, and there was very steep criteria to be a part of it. I think you had to have a 3.5 GPA, uh, and it was basically a partnership with parents and, and mentoring and reinforcement. It was great. If you're in high school in Pinellas County, uh, you were an Ebony Scholar mm -hmm. if you met those criteria. Mm -hmm. And your parents had to be involved? Yes, your parents had to be involved. It was a fundamental model so they before a, that a, was make formalized. So they an agreement that they would uh, I don't know that there was an agreement, but you had to, your parents had to agree to usher you to success. Mm -hmm. And I do know that the um, Edible Peace Patch is now taking over Ebony Scholars, because um, the group that was running Ebony Scholars, well, Moselle Davis, after Mr. Davis passed away, mm -hmm. it became um, too difficult for them to do it. So, it's a it's a very so it's a huge task, but it's great that they are mm -hmm. uh, resurging that because it makes such a difference. It's basically the model that you see with Academy Prep, mm -hmm. that type of complete wraparound of all the resources that you need to succeed, and it makes mm -hmm. a difference. The mm -hmm. outcomes are self-evident. And you're involved in Academy Prep. You mentor somebody there, don't I you? I do. I uh, have a mentee that I've been with for quite some time. Her name is Shaniqua, and she's very special to me. She's in college at her dream school in Chicago. Hmm. So here's the question. You're the deputy mayor. You have two children and then all these extended children. Mm -hmm. You have parents. You have a husband. Mm -hmm. um, you have friends. Mm -hmm. And you have this incredible demanding job. So how do you balance all of this? And you have someone you mentor and you probably do many other things that I don't even know about. How does somebody balance all of that and make sure that your children get enough attention, that your husband gets attention, that your parents get attention, and that the city gets attention? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind, no. I don't know. <laughs> well, the, the question is the answer. It's all those same people. It's that network mm -hmm. that hold me up and support me. And, you know, I'm just so honored to be in their presence. But it is. It's my parents and my husband and my kids and my friends. It's, uh, it's all of that. We, you know, we just kind of ebb and flow and give and take. And it works out. Mm -hmm. It works out. It's important work. And so there is space. You know, the universe just kind of makes space for what's important. So do you ever come home and just, like I'm exhausted, don't talk to me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but my mom is amazing. You know, my mom is amazing. She picks my kids up from school. She takes mm -hmm. them to whatever lessons they have. She makes sure that they've been fed. She makes sure they do their homework. And she then gets them showered, and then my husband comes in and takes over, and then I come home and say, don't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> and my, uh, my dad is right there, and it's great. It's wonderful. So it really is. It's the only is possibility. It's the only way it happens. Works all together. That's right. And then your husband has a job as well. He does. He works. He's an adventurer. <laughs> <laughs> My husband has like five jobs. Uh -huh. He's like the hardest working man in show business. Uh -huh. So he's an outdoors editor for Tampa Bay Times, right. but he does a television segment as well on Channel 28, ABC, ABC Sunday mornings. He does freelance writing. He's all over the place. And, and he's a scout master. I'm a Boy Scout wild widow. Wild adventures. We That's know right. all about this. He's the most interesting man in the world. Oh. <laughs> that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> Big bucks. So, um, so you go through all of this education and um, Ebony Scholars, and you go to college. Mm -hmm. So tell me about going to college. 
I had great college experience. I, know. <laughs> I went to Florida A&M University, which is a historically black college and university, and uh, it's just tremendous. It's and how did you get there? Well, Mr. Davis, Earl Davis, had a lot to do with it. He went there, didn't he? He went there, and yeah. he was like, "If you are great, you need to go there." And uh, he would always have Dr. Humphreys, who is the president, Fred Humphreys, come down, and he would recruit. Uh, handpicked students that he wanted to come and be a part of that school story and he did that with me I was a presidential scholar and it was the best experience of my life one of the best I should say but it was fantastic you know when you grow up uh, some of the presupposition that you talk about you grow up African-American in the south there's a lot of presupposition when you um, achieve things people kind of treat you as an ex um, exception exactly and uh, that, that does something debilitating to your psyche mm -hmm. in that your achievements are in spite of who you are. Right. Florida A&M was an environment where there were 10,000 people <laughs> who looked just like you achieving their biggest dreams with mm -hmm. everybody telling you it's because of who you are. Mm -hmm. And that four years of that validation just really set me up for, you know, as big as my dreams can go. Yeah. It's a special place. When we, um, last month when we were with the Chancellor of USS, at USFSP, we spoke about um, how education for women had the same thing that, you know, like Barnard, for example. Sure which was all women, that women who went there said they had a really special experience because they didn't have to worry about right. men being around. Yeah. And for you, you are not only a woman, but you're an African-American woman. So being in that environment really does help you not have to address certain distracting things. That's and true. for women, it's the same way. And there's been a re-looking at that, I think, mm -hmm. about because everything's been integrated racially and, and gender-wise and that. And is that the best way to really um, really serve somebody and right. develop the sense of character and self-worth and, and all of the talents that you can have? There seems to be that it has to be some middle ground, maybe. I think that that's right. Mm -hmm. And I think um, in context and for a certain segment, of one's life. Mm -hmm. It's super validating. Mm -hmm. I think as we truly grow as a society and there's less presupposition, mm -hmm. there will be, you know, less need. Mm -hmm. But it certainly serves a purpose now. Right. But that was a really important experience for you. Absolutely. And you didn't... My friend Delphinia is a rattler. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Okay. Okay. <laughs> is that what you do? Yes, that is the rattler strike. We strike, strike, and strike again. <laughs> there you go. Now you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I took my all my breath away. <laughs> Something interesting. My dad uh, went to Bethune Cookman, which is the oh, rival. Really? Uh huh. Of uh, Florida A and M, and we have a a game every year that we're a Florida Classic where Florida A and M plays Bethune Cookman, and I grew up sitting on the Bethune Cookman side always, and then I went to Florida A and M. So and is what a, is a Bethune Cookman? That's Wildcats. Wildcats. Now I get the Wildcat. <laughs> I get that. Okay. Well. Yeah. Those so are good um, when. How do you think about Florida A&M now? I mean, so do you see it as an important institution to keep going on? Do you see it changing and developing and getting some stability and growing more? Um, what do you see as the future of Florida A&M? So Florida A&M was founded in 1887, mm -hmm. you know, when um, Black people in Florida could not be educated anywhere else. They could be educated there. It's a state school. It's super important Was to it our the state's first, heritage. Was um, college, black college? In Florida, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, very important to our state's heritage, and it has absolute relevance, I think, for the future. 
uh, went through a devolution over the past yeah. decade, maybe decade and a half. Frederick Humphreys was such a transformational leader, he was so visionary, but uh, there was a leadership vacuum when, vacuum when he left and uh, went through some trying times. When I graduated in 1997, it was the Time Magazine University of the Year. It had the highest number of wow. uh, African-American National Merit Scholars of any school in the country, more than Harvard or Yale or anywhere. Um, but it, it went through a devolution. Now we have a new president who's just coming on board, Elmira Mag Magnum. And she's going to do great things. She comes from Cornell. Mm -hmm. And I really think that she's going to restore it to its former glory and make sure it's an opportunity that exists. It's maintained its commitment to opportunity for people where that college path is not traditional. The thing that was so magic about it when I was there was that it had the highest achieving African Americans and it had those people who'd been written off that couldn't get into school anywhere else. And it worked to make sure that everybody got what they needed. Um, over the past 15 years, it's lost that highest level. She's committed to bringing that back and I think that's where the future lies. So I think great things are ahead for Florida A&M. So how does an institution like Florida A&M lure the, the best African-American students away from going to UF, let's say, mm -hmm. or to USF? For me, I had a lot of options about where to go to college. I, I was getting multiple letters in the mail every day of people asking me to come to their school. And uh, it was the president saying to me, I need you at my school to make my school what I want it to be. That was hard to say no to. And he was the only one saying that. And uh, there were people who I'd grown up with who'd gone there, and it, it, was, it was just awesome. So it was that connection, that personal connection. And it was scholarship money. <laughs> that helped. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is a, a very interesting um, story in that. You're somebody who, from the start, was recognized as a person who was talented and could achieve. Mm -hmm. So you had the Ebony Scholar thing, which meant, in a way, you were chosen. And then the president of Florida A&M you know, chooses you to, um, and, and you have succeeded all along. I mean, you went to get a master's degree, then a PhD, then, and in between you worked at TV and newspaper, and then you did this big thing at hospitals, and now you're a deputy mayor. Mm -hmm. So when you're chosen like that, when you're sort of tapped and said, you know, you're someone to succeed, what, how, what does that do to you in terms of responsibility? This sense of... It's really heavy. Yeah. Um, I would, that's what I was thinking. It's, su it's super heavy, you know. It's, uh, I don't know. I've never been asked that question before. But um, especially when there are lots of people when your, your outcomes have the ability to make a difference for other people. Mm -hmm. um, it's a huge responsibility, but it's a privilege, you know. And... Uh, it's, it's my life, so I don't know. I don't have that kind of outside perspective on right. it because it's my life. I've been living it. Um, it's, it's just a very privileged, fortunate life. Mm -hmm. That's heavy. I mean, I think about that when I hear your story and I hear lots of other people's stories. What that means to, you know, have to get up every day and you have to go do things that... Mm -hmm. matter that affect lots of people's lives. Right. And I mean even going to college at Texas A&M, I mean that, you know, your parents are expecting things. People are, expect, you know, Mr. Davis is expecting Everybody things. Everybody expects the president. everything, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and what how that works. Um, now your children you know, you have expectations of them. And what that expectation does, how it works positively, and how it can be a burden, I, it's an it's a interesting dance. It is, it is. But um, 
It's, it's not a burden, I wouldn't mm -hmm. say. It certainly is heavy. It feels very heavy with responsibility, but there's so much privilege in it. It's such, you know, for, for all of our self-criticism about our presuppositions, mm -hmm. I do have to acknowledge it's an uncommon journey, mm -hmm. you know, to be born to parents who their biggest commitment in life is my sister and myself. Mm -hmm. That's how they identify themselves. They are parents. Everything they've done is for us, you know in this great city, to be born in this great city with this loving family that's all around me, and then to find a, such a wonderful husband and have these awesome children. There's no burden in it. It's, it's really mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, and I think the recognition of how awesome it is yields continual great things. Mm -hmm. So for example, I've, I've had wonderful uh, bosses. I've worked for great people, and that continues to happen. The mayor, he's so awesome. He couldn't be here tonight, but he, he came by. Yeah. He came by. Yeah. Wish me luck. Yeah. You know, that's who that's he really is. Great. It's great. It's mm -hmm. awesome. I work with a great team. Kevin King, our chief of staff, is here. He's one of the best people that you'll ever meet. And so there's no burden in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have like 12-hour days, six days a week. Not completely, but it's my privilege to mm -hmm. do it. It's, it's the least I can do in this great life. So when you're mentoring young people and you're talking to your children and they're thinking about what they want to be when they grow up, mm -hmm. or you're talking to your friends, or you know, you talk to Terry and you're talking to him about what he wants to do when he grows mm -hmm. up. <laughs> I've given him a deadline. So. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how do you, how do you, um, explain to, to encourage people to see it as a privilege. I mean, how do you get them, get or assist people to step into that place? I talk to Shaniqua, my mentee, about this all the time. And what do you say? Because she is experiencing comparable privilege. Now, her background is very challenged, um, but she has And she graduated, she went to Academy Prep. She went to Academy Prep, and then she went to Canterbury mm -hmm. School of Florida. My children go there as well. And uh, while she, the circumstances in which she was born are very challenging, she has had comparable opportunity and, and privilege amazingly so. She's so focused. She's very she's bright. she's completely consumed with what she's going to be when she grows up. She thinks she has to have all the answers right now. And what I tell her is to just figure out who you are, what you love, follow your bliss, and the rest will take care of itself. And that's what I really believe. The rest will take care of itself. I think that we all are called here with specific purpose, you know, and um, the responsibility is living boldly in that purpose for which we first drew breath mm -hmm. and yielding to the expectations. Don't worry about it. It'll take care of itself if we're doing, if we're honoring our purpose. So what if, what if you say to somebody, follow your bliss? Yeah. And the person says to you, well, I don't know what my bliss is. And I think that's one of the things that mm -hmm. is difficult for people is it's unclear to a lot of people what their bliss is. So how would you go about telling somebody how they figure that out? So it's like I'm talking to Shaniqua. That's right. Good. She's like, how do I know? How do I know what I'm supposed to do? You know because it is so peaceful and it is easy and you don't have to work. It is something you would do for free, perhaps even pay to do. Oh, so you know, will you pay to be our deputy mayor? Sure, if I could so afford, sure, absolutely. I mean, that's what that's what it is, though. Mm -hmm. It's it's finding that space and that place where it just is easy and it just is right. Mm -hmm. And the rest will take care of itself. I, you know, I wasn't saying I want to be the deputy mayor. You know, it, it was a job. It was it was created. Uh -huh. You know. It's like um, you should have a badge or something. It's like I, wanna, I want to make St. Petersburg the best place it can be. Mm -hmm. And so these opportunities present themselves for me to do so. So what happened was you were working at Bayfront. Before, and before this job? Yeah. I was actually working at the organization that uh, well, acquired Bayfront. Right. But yeah. You worked at Bayfront, then that gets closed, and you go to this other thing. Mm -hmm. um, so... 
how do you move from that to be chosen to be deputy mayor? Because it's not elected, you didn't run for it. It's an appointment, right? right? So how does that happen? Uh, I'd worked with Mayor Kreisman and his team a little bit prior. Uh, government relations is part of my job. And um, you worked with them. How? He is a legislator. And, oh, um, so when he was in Tallahassee? Yes, when he was in Tallahassee. And he was, you know, the type of legislator, he's so principled. It was the right thing to do. Not necessarily popular, but right. We knew we could go to him. We could go to him for advice, or we could go to him to carry a bill forward. Mm. Uh, an example would be we wanted to make hospital safe zones, gun-free zones, and nobody will touch the NRA mm -hmm. lobby. Uh, but he will. He'll do whatever is right. So we had that kind of mutual agreement and, res and, and respect around what's right, and we worked Our together well. Are hospitals in Florida not on? safe zones? I didn't think so. <laughs> we worked hard to make them be that. Mm -hmm. But um, I would have to guess that it had something to do with those interactions. You mm -hmm. know, I don't really know. That would be a question better for him, but he invited me to come serve with him. And, it's and what did he say? Will you be my deputy mayor or what? Uh, he, uh, we had a meeting in a park. In a park? In a park. Uh, and, uh, on a park bench? Yeah. It's like in a movie. <laughs> it was. <laughs> it was. And um, he was telling me about this position that he was envisioning, and I was kind of half listening because I needed to get back to a meeting. Um, I thought he just was interested in my perspective. Mm -hmm. And he said, and I'd like you to do it. And I was like, wait, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me again what it, what, what it is? <laughs> it's great. It's, it's a fantastic job. And did you say yes, or did you go home and talk to your husband, or what? Um. <laughs> I really don't remember. I think I said, of course I'll do that. <laughs> but then I think I asked my husband what he thought. <laughs> yeah, he's not answering. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so what do you actually do? Mm. So I work in partnership with the mayor, literally. We're partners. We're like, you know, they're partners in crime. We're partners in shine. I see. Sun shines here. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> to extend his reach. You know, to strategically advance his agenda, his objectives for the city. Uh, the demand on, on his time and his attention and his prioritization mm -hmm. is unreal. I've never seen anything like it. And so uh, he's committed to not just managing, he wants to lead the city into its best future. And so I help him do that, you know. Uh, there are times when he has to lead, and so I manage. There are times when he has to manage, and so I lead. But we're partners, and we walk in step. Can you give an example of how you do that? Literally the oper operations of it? Well, one example of, of something uh, that I do. A project that you've partnered in and how you... The budget, the development of the budget. Okay. Work very closely with that. Uh, he set out his priorities. We were pretty committed to aligning the budget, our investment, uh, in a way that would reflect his priorities for the city and his goals for the city. And uh, so he laid out the big picture of this is where I want to go. And I did the work with closely with our staff to do the background engineering to make that happen. I translate intent into action. Okay, so what are, his, what are your, and I mean both of your, top three priorities? Top three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I would rank them because okay. they really uh, hold equal equal weight. Okay. Um, but I'd have to start with our vision. We have a vision. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing that we did as a team. Uh, it serves as an overarching goal, guides all of our plans and our actions, and reflects our priorities. And that vision is that St. Petersburg will be a city of opportunity where the sun shines on all who come to live, work, and play. We will be an innovative, creative, and competitive community that honors our past while we pursue our future. And so, and we're moving, al moving toward that along four strategic pathways. And um, so the priorities that come out of that are, it's all about opportunity, first of all. Mm -hmm. It's neighborhoods, for sure, public safety, uh, innovative infrastructure and solutions, 
I'd say, in mm -hmm. education. While we don't have direct responsibility for education, we understand it has everything to do mm -hmm. with quality of life in our city. And so it's top, top priority. The other thing I put in there, because it has to go in there, is business, local business mm -hmm. uh, support and development and acceleration. So um, given that we're in a temple of the arts, mm -hmm. um, how do you see the arts in Oh, the arts is city? there too. My bad. The arts is seriously there. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Way up there. <laughs> would have said the arts first. That's why he's the mayor. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> so, um, you say, you know, you have this vision thing that you come out with, and it has a sense to it, but it there's a sense in which it sounds a little bit like a slogan, mm -hmm. you know? And I have to say, I think at least my eyes start glazing over because it, you know, it just sounds like something that people say, mm -hmm. that when you go into, have a group and you go into this workshop to do your vision, you make up something. So what's behind that? I mean, what's motivating that vision? So you want it to be for It's real. All. So the key is taking it from rhetoric right. to reality, right? So I want to get translating more. intent into action. How do you action. translate that into reality? What programs? What it's specific a, it's a, it's things? A, so it's a very real litmus test against which we hold all of our objectives against. Mm -hmm. You know, it is the um, determinant of how we spend our time how we invest the city's resources, you know. So give, can you can, give me an example of a project you've done and how it fits with that? Sure, okay. so it's all about opportunity. It's about the ability to see opportunity for yourself if mm -hmm. you are a part of our community and achieve it mm -hmm. in a very real and tangible way. So we have these small business tours because we're committed to local business. Okay. You know, uh, the mayor talks about how cities often roll out the red carpet for big business and the red tape for small. And he's not having it. So, you know, we have probably to date visited 50 to 60 small businesses where we talk with mm. owners <laughs> about what the city can do to help accelerate their success. Sometimes it's about creating new programs, but sometimes it's about getting out of the way. Sometimes it's about mm -hmm. getting rid of bureaucracy. But so we you want, can get a permit really easily. That's right, that's right. Um, it's really connecting with the people who comprise the city to help their dreams be real. You know, it isn't, it isn't rhetoric. It's the articulation of all of the reasons the mayor ran for the job. It's why all of the people who surround him came to work with him. And it's what the 2,700 people who make up the city team come to do every day. Mm -hmm. It's about that servant leadership that is really focused on the city we want to be, understanding where we are, and navigating the delta in between. You know, we're filling that void every day with tons of programs. And great solutions have come out of that small business mm -hmm. tour that we hear from a business in Tyrone, but it helps businesses throughout the city. Mm -hmm. And it's making a great difference. And that's, that's how we live the vision. That's how it becomes real. So one of your focuses is on Midtown. So can you point Midtown out? Sure. And so Midtown is, this is a little bit hard to see, but it literally is how, how it's described. It runs from 2nd uh, Street to 34th Street and 4th Avenue to 30th Avenue. And so why does it get so much attention? Because there is disproportionate need there. Um, there is th the biggest obstacle between St. Petersburg with all of the wonderful things happening here mm -hmm. and the city we want to be where and the key there is the sunshine's on all of us you know that that hope 
and enthusiasm and excitement that you feel when you walk through downtown St. Petersburg, mm -hmm. we need that to be as real in every corner of our community. Mm -hmm. And the place that it's least real is Midtown. Mm -hmm. So citywide, we have a 16% poverty rate. In Midtown, it's 25%. Uh, we have a community redevelopment area that makes up a lot of that, and it's 36% there. Uh, it's disproportionate need. There is a lack of resources. So how, how was it that our city allowed that to happen? You know, that's a good question. Um, it probably dates back 40 to 60 years and has a lot to do with... Uh, the unintended consequences of integration. Mm -hmm. uh, the major corridor of Midtown, 22nd Street, also known as the Deuces, mm -hmm. was uh, the equivalent of our downtown Central Avenue. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, back in the day. It was bustling. It was great business, uh, lots of entrepreneurship. Um, and when integration happened, it just eroded that business center. Uh, when people had more options, and um, as a result, there was just this kind of devolution of the commerce that it takes for a community to be strong. So, I've heard discussion from many people that there's been a lot of emphasis on Midtown and trying to revitalize it, mm -hmm. but that it hasn't worked. So, what do you see your team your partnership with the man. What are you doing different that's going to make this difference? So we shifted the equation a little bit when we came into op office. The first thing we did, you'll notice uh, Nikki Capehart. She's our director of urban affairs, uh, and that's very purposeful. She's not the director of Midtown. We understand that the needs uh, of our community stretch beyond those geographic boundaries and touch Child's Park and other areas of the community. Uh, we've done great work in the city. Where's Child's Park? Can you point that out? Sure. So Child's Park is in southwest St. Pete, kind of along the 49th Street corridor. Mm. I think it's right about here. Mm -hmm. I can't quite see. But um, so Nikki heads up urban affairs. So wherever there is need, that's where she focuses. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the big shift. Also, the big shift being there's one person designated no, to focus. No, that she's not focused on those geographic boundaries. I see. So, for example, Maximo Elementary is a failing elementary school. It is not located in mid Midtown. Mm -hmm. Um, but she gives attention to Maximo Elementary because there is need there. Mm -hmm. uh, she gives a lot of attention to 49th Street because there is need there. And when you say she gives attention, what does that attention look like? And why is that different than attention that's been given before? Well, it's specific to the need. So an example is uh, one of the biggest opportunities on 49th Street in that Child's Park area is to build a bridge. It's a shared corridor with Gulfport. Um, Gulfport makes up one side of the street, and St. Petersburg mm -hmm. is on the other side of the street. So she's working hard with other members of our team to build bridges there, to infuse resources. Okay. You don't mean real bridges. You mean, no, no, I mean I social, when you said once social again, capital. A bridge? Social yeah, capital. Okay, thank you. That will result in erasing boundaries mm -hmm. and um, getting rid of that invisible wall. Um, becoming stewards and caretakers of the neighborhood and the community in a way that elevates it. And she's coordinating that. So literally, it's giving attention. It's paying attention to those things that fall through the cracks. And that hadn't been done before? Not necessarily with that same focus. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of focus, and it's easy in government uh, to do this, on infrastructure. There's a lot of money available to build places. You know, mm. the federal government will help us. The state will help us. We spent two hundred. Mean like build houses or, or rehab historic buildings, mm -hmm. or if you look at Twenty Second Street and Sixteenth Street in Midtown, there's beautiful palm trees and lots of right. infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Two hundred million dollars over the past ten to fifteen years, and and that's great. That's it a was lot needed. Of money. Yeah. But our administration is very focused on the people who occupy those places mm. so that they can transcend their current circumstance and begin to define their own destiny. And again, that goes back to opportunity. So that is a That's, difference. And it's harder. That's a heavier right. lift right. that looks different, mm -hmm. you know, that, that uh, manifests in a different way. I think that, I mean, we've talked about this in our town before. 
I think that there is a general recognition that if this is successful, that our whole city will be lifted to a whole different place. Mm -hmm. As long as there's some areas that are so underserved in our city, it can't function right because either we're ignoring it, pretending it's not there, That's right. and you know we seeps through and all of this. But if that if we all can be lifted, then. It helps. It helps everything. We we'll have to so, get that right. So I mean, even if there, you know, one can sell it through self-interest, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and self-interest or right. altruism. Exactly. You know, whatever the motivator. Mm -hmm. Mayor is very clear that we have to get that right. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, are you going to succeed in the first term, or? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that was we're working answer. hard. We're, we're working very hard every day, giving it our all. And we have mm -hmm. lots of, you know, for so many of our initiatives, really all we have to do is give people opportunity and move out of the way because great things are happening and they're happening organically. Mm -hmm. uh, the Warehouse Arts District, mm -hmm. that movement is transformational. It's going to change the face of Midtown mm -hmm. and the deuces in a way that we never could from the mayor's office. Right. Uh, so we're doing everything we can to accelerate that and make that happen. They're and their Midtown, who's here, who's associated with that? Can you raise your hands? Carrie, you want to raise your hand too? Absolutely. Who else is associated? Larry. It's yeah, Larry. A bunch of people there you go. Helping to make that happen. Yeah. So if you could do one thing, okay, so you get one thing to do in the city. I'll give you all the money you want, all the power you want. What would you do? Mm. Let me just sit in that for a minute. <laughs> just that thought. <laughs> just that thought. Oh, my gosh. I think that I would. Oh, my gosh. I can't even imagine. It's hard, isn't it? Because it's sort of what you always want. Oh, I wish I could do anything I want. But right. OK. I think it would just infuse resources into the disproportionately served areas of the community uh, and do so in a way that really fosters opportunity. Um, focus a lot on early childhood education mm -hmm. and get babies before they understand that the world doesn't expect them to succeed mm -hmm. and pump into them everything it takes and then watch them soar. And the rest will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. If we take care of our kids, the city's going to be awesome. Right. Well, USFSP is doing a program like that. Yes, with John Hopkins. With John Hopkins. Absolutely. That's, and that's the innovation district at work. Yes. Um, I think that a lot is going to manifest mm -hmm. for our city because of those giants who sit on that corridor. Who are partnering. Who are partnering to create value added that doesn't mm -hmm. exist now mm -hmm. because of collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming, and um, thank you for making the last Art Town of 2014 have be a great one, and we hope to look forward to 2015, and, um, and I think this was just a wonderful way to celebrate Art Town by having you here. Thank you, so Carol. So please thank.